A young Western man is choosing, becoming a monk, an ascetic, and celibate in the Burmese tradition of Theravadan or Southeast Asian Buddhism. He, like other Westerners before him, has decided to renounce the worldly life for a rigorous, demanding schedule of meditation and study. <coughs> he is entering into a tradition that is 2,500 years old, and it is enjoying a renaissance thanks to a Burmese meditation master, Mahasi Saida. If desire ends, clinging and pleasure seeking, karma will also come to an end. With the ending of karma, there will be an end of Rebirth along with the suffering of old age and death. Realizing all these facts, the Bodhisattva meditated. Interesting thing that Mahasi Sayadaw has come to this country. He is the foremost meditation teacher, master, and scholar in the entire Theravada world, which encompasses the most extensive um, order of monks and the largest number of Buddhist followers that exist in the world today, perhaps uh, uh, 50 million or 100 million Buddhists and uh, a, a half a million monks. He has been more influential than any other teacher in this century and perhaps for many hundreds of years in establishing an interest in revival in extended and deep meditation practice and has trained in his centers and through his disciples and students almost one million people in intensive insight meditation practice. Uh, he was the head of the council that celebrated the 2,500th year of the Buddhist teachings in Burma, one of the most important figures as a scholar and as a man to revive the importance of the Buddhist uh, psychological and scriptural teachings and through his life he has been uh, an incredibly respected and profound influence on the Buddhist countries in which he's lived and taught Burma, Ceylon, Thailand. His coming to the West at, at the age of 75 to me feels like the final uh, final teaching assignment in his life, the final flowering or expression of his great impact in the Buddhist world, Mahasi Saido in his own home country is considered to be fully enlightened. What that means is he is a man who has penetrated to the very depths of the Buddhist teaching and so transformed his mind through understanding and through purification that theoretically anyway, no longer do fear or greed or hatred or anger even arise within his mind. It is a mind that is so balanced and so present in each moment without these qualities of grasping that its whole relationship to the world is simply one of awareness and compassion through his teaching and loving kindness. According to Indian practice, the yogi must sit in cross-legged position. This is directed to enable the yogi to sit for long. According to the writers of some parts of the world, one may also sit on a chair and meditate. 
Ujjokayam Panidaya. The upper part of the body must be kept straight. The mind should be directed towards the object of the meditation. The mind should be directed towards the object of meditation. Vipatana, Vipassana meditation means observing every phenomenon occurring at the six sense doors. Jack Cornfield is a man who has spent five years in Southeast Asia as a Buddhist monk undergoing traditional training in the Theravanan monasteries of Burma, Thailand, and Laos. He has a PhD in psychology and a master's degree studying clinical psychology and its relation to meditation as a clinical tool in a Western psychological tradition. He has spent the past six years teaching retreats and meditation of Buddhist psychology in universities and retreat settings throughout this country. Mahasi Sayadaw chose to begin his Dharma teaching last night by reviewing the life of the Buddha himself. The Buddha practiced the perfections of compassion and virtue, of concentration, wisdom, and eventually was reborn as a small town prince in Nepal, northern India, grew up in the palace life, was married to a beautiful princess, but at some time in his youth went out and d discovered that even though one be born into the most fortunate circumstances in this life, as the Prince Siddhartha was born, still there was the basic human difficulties for all of us of old age, of sickness, of death, of the kinds of sorrow and suffering of being separated from that which we love at some point or associated with that which we do not. And so in seeing these as the basic human, inevitable human problems and conditions, Prince Siddhartha left home to find an answer to these question of human suffering for himself and out of compassion for all beings. Upon leaving home, he studied with the greatest teachers of India at that time and mastered jhanas or trances, concentration to a very high degree. He was able to make his mind pure and peaceful and still. But every time he came out of these trances, he still discovered that there was craving and grasping and prejudice and hatred in the mind that remained for him when he was no longer attentive to his meditation. He undertook many years of ascetic practice, self-mortification and torture of the body as a way to purify himself, but also discovered that this didn't uproot these difficulties and problems in the mind, didn't solve the most basic problem of inner liberation. And so, withdrawing from his ascetic practices and undertaking what became the central component of his teaching, the middle path, he took food, sat down under the Bodhi tree with the resolve to practice until he became fully enlightened, came to that complete and total freedom and liberation of mind, which he then taught with great loving kindness and compassion and skill for 45 years for the rest of his life throughout that area of Asia and India. Our own problem of dealing with suffering and sorrow and the difficulties that arise in our lives is identical with that of the Buddha. And the teachings have been given in order for us to apply and understand these basic truths of that which brings difficulty and sorrow through grasping and that which is the potential for each one of us of insight 
and liberation of our hearts. This tape records a personal transmission. Here, Mahasi Saido's 54-year-old translator, U Silananda, a Burmese monk, explains how Mahasi Saido went to his teacher to receive his first initiation. Saido decided to go to Mingun Saido and practice under his guidance. <coughs> when the Venerable Saido reached uh, Mingun Saido and Saido, uh, on the night when he reached, Venerable Zero and Sierra gave instructions to the Venerable Mahasi Sierra on Satipatthana meditation. <coughs> uh, this instruction was according to the Satipatthana Sutta to note uh, walking when the yogi is walking, to note lying when he is lying, <coughs> to note sitting when he is sitting, and also to note the physical and mental activities, all the physical and me mental activities, and also to note when they occur. Sierra practiced, uh, practiced Vipassana meditation under Mingun Sierra for four months. Sierra intended to stay there for one year, but circumstances did not permit Sierra to stay there for a year. I'll tell you later that <clears throat> when Sierra was practicing Vipassana meditation there, Sierra said he practiced intently and with vigor and energy. There were days and nights when Sierra did not have even a wink. He did not sleep at all for 24 hours. And there were some days and nights when he did not speak even a word to other people at that and without any break. And uh, for a month, Sado had to go on arms every day. And when going out for arms, Sado marked every step, stepping, stepping, and also everything he saw and heard and everything that went on his mind. So without any break, Sado diligently practiced Vipassana meditation, started practicing Vipassana meditation. He was only 28 years old. Sierra was born in 1904, and so Sierra started practicing Vipassana meditation in 1932. <coughs> and after that time, Sierra practiced himself, but as he was a little young, he did not preach his and in uh, give instructions to other people. But one day, Seattle's younger brother died, and Seattle was alarmed and thought that my brother died not having practiced Vipassana meditation because I have not given him instruction. And from that time on, Sierra was intent on giving instruction, Vipassana meditation. And that opportunity, Sierra got in 1938. This tradition, which began in Burma, moved to the Western world. Manindra, an Indian of a Buddhist family from Calcutta, became the missing link. Manindra is an Anagarika, which literally translates as he who has no home. Not quite monk, and certainly not householder, the 65-year-old man sleeps an average of three and a half hours a night. He is a proficient Sanskrit scholar and has held many positions of importance pertaining to Buddhist affairs for the Indian government. And uh, in the meantime, the government of Burma, the then Prime Minister of Burma, invited me to go to Burma to learn Dhamma, uh, and to practice meditation. And on leave for three months, I went to Burma. Mm -hmm. And there, and uh, I, uh, with, with some of the two of other friends, I went to Burma and, uh, and went to Tathanikta, the main international meditation center in Burma, 
which uh, where Ma Venerable Mahasi Siyada uh, was the chief meditation master. I was placed at his disposal. So I spent uh, nearly nine years there, but within five years I completed the whole study and, and uh, as a brahmachari, anagarika, not as a monk. Because as a monk, I thought that if I become monk, and uh, I have to uh, oblige the uh, uh, Daika's supporters and to go there and to accompany the monk, go for uh, going for alms begging. Mm -hmm. I, I may, n may not find proper right time, and I may waste time in this way. So that's why I prefer to remain as brahmachari. Training, I taught many students in Burma. Then I thought I, I must uh, leave for India. Yeah. And when I arrived in India, since my arrival in 1967, since that time, I begin to teach, but there is, there is no proper center in Buddha Gaya. And uh, it was difficult. In the beginning, I was uh, staying in uh, some guest house there. Then at the request of the Samanno Ashram, which is, a, which is established by Acharya Binibhav Bhave, one of the friends and disciples of Mahatma Gandhi. There is a Gandhi Ashram in near Bud at Buddha Gaya. So they invited me to uh, stay there. At, uh, and I spent several years there and the uh, people became, came to know about my coming and the some uh, professor students and some uh, 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 marwaris business people from Bodh gaya they used to come often and on to hear to discuss dhamma to practice there in Bodh gaya and also during my stay there and uh, i used to meet people from all over the world there he met and taught Joseph Goldstein, an American who now teaches meditation globally. Finished my Peace Corps tour, I returned to America and began to practice the meditation on my own. After a short time, I realized the importance and the need for having systematic guidance and instruction, feeling a real important need for a teacher, and decided at that time to return to Asia. My plan was to eventually end up in Thailand with a stopover in India where some friends had given me the names of various teachers there. I went to India and through a series of circumstances I ended up in Bodh Gaya, the place where the Buddha was enlightened, where I met my first teacher of meditation, Anagarika Munindra. And that was how I ended up in India. I just started, decided to stay there and do the intensive practice. For me most, in the beginning, was less the personal connection and more the attunement to the Dharma practice itself. The explanation of the practice was so simple and so pure, and it resonated really deeply with my own experience that I became very inspired and motivated to continue with the practice. Over a period of months and years of being close with Manindraji, I then developed a close personal, personal relationship also. But in the beginning, it was, it was very much the attunement to the practice. Uh, individually, whatever I could, uh, being in the ashram, I was helping people, sharing my experiences, teaching them. Uh, but I was not satisfied with my teaching. I could not devote full time, um, and I had a Intent, I had an intention, a plan, to train a band of young boys and girls, male and female, both theory and practice, and uh, to train in Samap and Vivasana thoroughly, and uh, when there is a proper arrangement. But uh, this could not happen. Joseph, oh, nine or ten years ago in Bodh Gaya, when he came to you um, as a student, do you remember that time, or do you remember your early impressions of him, and can you talk about your relationship with him since? And like a text like, there is a proverb, like a text like, and <laughs> uh, uh, wherever, uh, when we meet people, when persons affinity with, affinity with similar kind of ideals or characteristics, at once you become friend. The here, of course, in Buddha Dhamma, and we say the Kalyana Mitra, not, uh, um, not the hanging around the Guru, but we say the Kalyana Mitra, a spiritual friend. And uh, uh, 
of uh, he has uh, spent nearly six years there studying practicing and uh, uh, sometime in summer time go to the hill coming back to the buddha gaya again uh, studying practicing so he is very one of the uh, uh, one of the students who is very sincere and earnest and devoted and uh, and the, in the uh, base in the groups of the in the beginning of state when i came from burma and uh, and i suppose he, and also he, he received the teachings he, uh, uh, mind was very receptive received the teaching and, uh, and gra- understood it cl- clearly and practiced very sincerely and successfully and uh, i think he is one of the uh, one of the best students on in in those days learned many things i learned the quality of simplicity of allowing the mind to take things in a simple and easy way not to not to allow the mind to complicate unnecessarily one's ongoing experience i also learned through his own example of understanding that there was no need to hold on to a self image whether a worldly self image or spiritual self image he himself was a model of somebody was so completely himself in all the circumstances that I could observe him without any kind of image that he was projecting and that was a great freedom there was a great there was a great freedom in seeing that we didn't have to hold on to to a model of personality to a model of a way of behaving in beginning a spiritual path Jim <coughs> I know that after establishing the center in Rangoon of Tathagata <coughs> that his teachings spread very wide in Burma and that there have been many hundred thousand perhaps almost a million students who have practiced Burma in Thailand and Sri Lanka um here in this room there are now several generations of students of Saida Piyaji there is Saida Piya himself and there's Anagarika Manindra who studied long ago in Burma and then his student who studied 10 years ago in Bodhgaya Joseph and Joseph's student who is Alan who's sitting behind him um what does Saida Pia think of this is it going okay <laughs> <laughs> ဆရာရောဘုရားရဲ့တပဲဝိဒီမူနင်ဒရာအဲမူနင်ဒရာရဲ့တပဲတကားဒီကိုးစတိုင်းကိုးစတိုင်းရဲ့တပဲဟို
and Burmese. For this two-week retreat, the schedule is already posted, I believe, on the bulletin board, and it will involve an alternation of sitting and walking meditation, starting with a bell tomorrow morning at 4.30 to wake up, and a sitting from 5 to 6, and a period for walking meditation, then breakfast at 6.30, and then again, walking period or time to do yoga or exercise. Following that, they'll be sitting and walking alternately from 8 o'clock until 11.30 lunch for an hour or 45 minutes each of sitting and walking, all on the schedule. About 10.30, uh, we had our lunch. <clears throat> and uh, from 12 to 1 o'clock, uh, we take rest. And from 1 o'clock until evening, we have study again. Uh, the same as in the morning. We go to various teachers and study different subjects. Six o'clock, a sitting followed each night by a Dharma talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And then, again, a couple more hours of sitting and walking until late tea at 9.30, and then bedtime or further practice for those who are awake. Routine. And the night blessings uh, consist of the lessons in Abhidhamma, because <coughs> Abhidhamma is very popular in our country. And uh, <coughs> these Abhidhamma lessons are uh, arranged so that we can study or learn Abhidhamma during the night. Uh, during the day, we study these texts and the explanations of them. And at night, before a teacher, we go, we, go, we go before a teacher and we recite that what we have learned during the day, and he gave explanations to it. The schedule basically gives you very little time to do anything else but to pay attention to yourself. While you're here, please refrain from reading, from writing, from speaking, from being involved in other activities. This two weeks is a very precious time, and its essence, its purpose, is to learn about yourself in the most deep way that you can, to pay attention and listen to the body, to the mind, to the emotions, to all the parts of your experience with care and with concentration from the moment that you awaken all the way until the time that you go to sleep. Personal interviews between student and teacher are used to monitor progress according to a pre-existing series of mental states which the teacher may guide the student towards. The concentration, that is for the jhanic jan state. Um, also, sometimes in my sitting practice when my mind gets very quiet, um, I begin to lose a sense of separation from the objects yeah. of awareness. A, thought, a, a sound will arise. Yeah. And there will be no sense of someone hearing the sound, but sure. just the sound so, arising in yes, space. Yes. Or if I'm sitting talking with someone, sometimes yeah. there's the sense of the other person and myself just both being in space and not mm -hmm. the same kind of separate. <laughs> Uh, do you think that when you hear this sound, it sound uh, arises and passes away, or just a continuous sound you are hearing? No, it arises and passes away. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you hear that sound like this, do you know the meaning of the sound? In case somebody is talking, you hear somebody talking, and if the sound is not continuous, you may not be able to follow what the, is the talking. Do you have this kind of sensation? Or do you follow what the other people is speaking in case you're hearing somebody speaking? Well, sometimes it's just sound. Ah, and I, I don't follow the what so quickly that yeah. I don't understand the yeah. word. Sometimes if a sound arises, mm -hmm. I notice that my mind will make a note of what the sound yes. is, like bird or yeah. car. Yeah. Sometimes a sound arises and that note um, doesn't come. Mm -hmm. Just sound. <laughs> 
So said, it's very good that when you hear the sound, you hear that as a, simply there's a bare attention of the sound. And it also, you notice that it arises and passes away. So Sharo said, when the master advise you, uh, that you also, uh, when, during your sitting meditation, try to be aware of the sitting posture and uh, how it is, the weight, how it happened. Because since your concentration power is very good, and try to uh, improve your concentration power so that whenever you hear the sound, it be just bare sound. Uh, you don't have the idea that it's a bird sound, it's a sound of a dog. People often think that meditation is a withdrawal from the world or an otherworldly activity. Actually, what happens is a very direct and immediate experience of one's own mind and body of getting into an intimate communication, an intimate understanding of how one's own experience is happening. And so rather than being a withdrawal from the world, it's rather an opening to oneself and how one responds to the world and one's environment in a very, in a very deep and immediate way. Using the breath as a foundation of practice, simply training the mind to become somewhat concentrated and calm, allows for the possibility of opening up to a deeper awareness of all the other more subtle mind-body processes. And so we begin to tune to the different levels of bodily energies that are going on to release a lot of the tension that we hold in our bodies through the, through the practice of awareness. We begin in the practice to become aware of thoughts and feelings and sensations, all kinds of mental phenomena as well and it leads to a real understanding of how the mind is working. Tradition in Asia for the support of teachers is that the teaching is always given freely. There's no charge for the teaching itself. Bringing, bringing this tradition to America, we found the need to charge at retreats to cover the cost of food and lodging but we didn't want to include in that cost any kind of salary or remuneration for the teachers as a way of maintaining that tradition of offering the teachings in a, free, a freely given way. So we rely on what is called dana in Pali language. Dana means offering. At the end of retreats, any of the students who wish can make, can make an offering or contribute some dana, which we use for our support. And this is how you've been living for, for the past five years or so? Right. Um, it, it, it's a very wonderful relationship then uh, between student and teacher. It, it's another way of making, of making a meanif meaningful contact. Amma Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhurasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhurasa Pudang Sanang Chami Tamang Sanang Chami Sangang Sanang Chami Duty ampi budang sanang chami. Duty ampi damang sanang chami. Duty ampi sangang sanang chami. Tati ampi budang sanang chami. Tati ampi damang sanang chami. 
Tatiampi Sangang Sarnang Chami Nyadana Varamani Sikabadam Samadhi Ami Kamma Summa Chachara Varamani Sikabadam Samadhi Ami Abrahma Charya Varamani Sikabadam Samadhi Ami Musa Vada Varamani Sikabadam Samadhi Ami Sura Me